Lini sucked in two deep breaths as the creature reached out a hand, her mind still in a bit of panic, but the creature did smile and spoke. Hey, are you okay? It asked slowly and in a tone that sounded concerned. I am the one that should be falling over, considering the fact I can make both weapons that did and didn't yet exist in my world, you have literally given me the ability to do what most, unknown, could only dream of. Leoni slowly willed herself back in control of herself, then took its hand and found herself quickly and effortlessly back to her feet. The sudden show of force from it unsettled more of her. As it was, the creature's strength was reinforced, but she swallowed hard. I must apologize again. My conduct is unbecoming of a princess in my position. Do you have more questions? She asked in a soft tone that willed it to mask her growing fear. This Jason creature shook its head and spoke in a calm and genuine tone she believed. No, I am going to help you and your nation. You have been good to me so far, but... It suddenly pulled her in by their still interlocking hands and nearly growled the next word. I am a free man and will not be made a slave to anyone, even the gods of this world, okay, princess? Its eyes were locked on her. The proximity and stance along with the way it was holding her in place caused her fear to run rampant in her mind. Her mind that was making up theories as to why it said that of all things, and before she could form a counteroffer or response, the creature spoke again. I am not sure as to me you all feel normal, but I have a feeling that you were going to treat me like a summoned beast. As it let her go, she instinctively took a few steps back, picking up the longsword of the raider, but it raised its hand to her, as though to stop her from advancing her current plan. Your reaction just now was all I needed. I'm going to forgive you this one time, however, if you or anyone in your queendom even attempts to put me under their will by might or magic, I will not hesitate to destroy them, then the nation, is that clear? Lini stared a bit bewildered, but mostly still terrified at the creature, and managed to fluster out a single word as her reaction. How? The Jason withdrew its hand and scratched at the back of its head. Because I am a unknown, and I really like some regional works of literature and art, where the people in the story get summoned, and in a fair few slavery is a thing, Moreover, in a few, slavery even knocks on the main, main entity of a story, and they are enslaved. I figured me and you should lay the ground rules of enslaving me, then suffer now over later. It said in a mixture of joy, weariness, excitement, and certainty, all of which did not dissuade her fear. But something about the way he smiled about it calmed her, a smile that was less of a clear threat and more of a promise, an agreement between the two. I can't really complain about it now. Magic will not work on you even if I wished it had. However, my preconceived notion that I would have to enslave you to guarantee your aid was wrong. You are clearly a person with a complete personality, unlike the monster I summoned in the castle I once had. She started, but fell off. She barely escaped that night. I will, however, apologize again for attempting to enslave you on arrival. Please forgive me, Jason. She said and bowed a bit towards it. No, not it, him. Jason smiled warmly. Apology accepted. Besides, it's not every day I would get to meet a princess, he said in a gentle and reassuring tone. Now why don't we go and find survivors? Then see about going to meet the queen. Lini nodded and walked out the door, going about calling out to people while Jason just calmly walked behind her. The better part of an hour of searching gave grim results. As of the once 100-person village, all that remained was six, four women, and two men. Based on their appearance, they were a family unit, and the three eldest women showed signs of having fought. After a bit of an explanation on who Jason was and why it was following her, the six allowed him to administer first aid, which to her seemed like little more than the practices of a herbalist. But Jason claimed that now they would hopefully not get an infection at least. Jason then turned to her after tying the last bandages he somehow created like his weapons. She couldn't even think of how or why it worked as the item was neither weapon nor armor, yet it worked somehow. He smiled wide and then looked around. Right where do we go from here, the capital, I assume? Liani wanted an answer to how he was using his power, but shook her head. The capital was lost three months ago, and the siege to retake it has been going poorly. To see the queen, we will be going east to the fortress city of Shreki. That is, where my mother is. 
She said, then looked around and thought over their search of the village, and recalled that most of the beasts were killed or ran off. It will take a few days to cover the distance on foot. Jason thought it over, then smiled. I think we will not have to walk. Let me try something. He said, then raised his hand to a clear space, and a carriage of both metal and other things appeared next to him. It had four doors on the sides and one in the front and back that looked like it was meant for cargo or something, then thought it over and summoned a book into his hands. Huh. This was the straw that broke Liani's resolve to glaze over issues with his power. What the lower planes? She screamed out of annoyance, anger, and exasperation. Books, bandages, and magic tools that summon smoke are one thing, but this is a carriage. It is not even a weapon, let alone armor, she declared while throwing her arms around. What are you talking about? I am using the powers as you set them up, Jason said, and had to take a step back as she glared at him, her fury at the brazen display of using the magic she gave him in a way she never imagined. But he swallowed and continued, this is called a war carriage. I have driven one years ago and made the book as a refresher just to make sure I don't fuck this up. It is the basic transport vehicle that my military uses. As for the books, bandages, and magical tools, they can all be used by me to kill things, so it's not like my power is not working right. But how did you summon that? It's not armor or a weapon. It's a war carriage, as you called it. Add to that that we have no beast to pull the damn thing, and I can only assume it needs at least six to eight beasts, which we can't even properly secure too, as there is no place to attach the beast harnesses. So explain to me how the lower planes you summoned it? She basically screamed back at him, her patience for this and his words not calming her down at all. Jason seemed to think over the issue a bit, then turned and walked to the front side of the carriage, undoing the latch on one side close to the door, before walking around the whole thing to the other side and undoing the latch there, too, before lifting the door up and out from the center and waved her over. As she walked, she noticed that the space for cargo she had assumed would be there was full of something, a complex construct of some kind, before Jason spoke up, this is the war carriage's advanced fire and wind magic construct. It allows this thing to move without the need for beasts for riding and labor. It can get up to about 96,800 yards an hour when fully loaded, or 123,200 yards an hour when it is not loaded up. It needs about half a barrel of oil to run off and can go for 880,000 yards on that. He looked up to her. Liani felt her blood run cold again. This carriage she was looking at, it could go farther than a rider on horseback, not just farther, but also it could carry more. Her mind wondered, as she looked over to the glass that she could see, looking inside, the eight of them will be a bit cramped, but they could all fit. Your army uses them as basic transports, she said as she walked over to Jason, but he then spoke more. As for why I can summon it, my people sometimes use it as a weapon tower. Add to that that I can run over someone with it, and it provides protection to those inside, so to me, it is both weapon and armor, he said with a smile which made her head hurt at the idea that he was ferocious enough to simply trample his enemies with this thing. So, you are skilled enough to make anything you can think of that is usable as a weapon by you because that is how I set up my spell, she said half-heartedly, and watched as he smiled and nodded. Her mind went into autopilot as she started to figure out what the hell that meant for him and how to handle this. And worse off, she would not be able to warn her mother as they would reach the city today. Lini finally snapped out of her active planning. Her seat inside the war carriage dampened the rocking as the carriage moved. The belts, he said, were needed for her safety pulled a bit hard on her. But also Jason tapped her shoulder. He was holding some vial of blue liquid in his hand. What is this? she asked as she took the vial and looked at the unknown substance inside. It's a mana potion. I tried to make one and succeeded. I thought you may need to let your queen and the city know we are on our way, Jason said back while continuing to control the carriage. Liani took the vial and looked it over, and she used the last of her mana to check it over, but like everything he made, it was unaffected by the magic. She took a nervous swallow and drank it quickly. The flavor was pleasant as it went down, about as sweet as some of the fresher fruits. But as soon as it hit her stomach, a wave of fresh and clean mana radiated out, and then some more than she could realistically use in a day. 
Then while looking at the vial, she looked up to him. Wait, how the lower planes can you make a mana potion? Um, well, you can break the glass and shove the shards into the throat of the enemy, he said, then glanced over to her and seemed to read the questions a bit deeper. As for how I can make a mana potion, as I said, I am a unknown. And based on the test earlier, I figured that I can make things from other stories and games, so I gave it a try. He added, then pointed into the space between the seats, and she saw a veritable collection of different things, some she recognized as swords, axes, shields, and even a wand, while others were those of battle staffs he used, but each had a distinct flair to it as it was clearly made with different core elements in mind, along with some talismans and jewelry. Reaching back, she took hold of one sword and pulled it to her. It was a short blade, about the size of a guard's short sword, but it was an odd design that had a wide plane close to the middle and tapering inwards a bit close to the handle, with a script of some kind running along the blade and some of the cross guard. I don't suppose your world has Orkian in it? Jason asked, in a tone she now recognized as a half-hearted joke. But his question to her was important, as he seemed to ask it because of the blade. The Orkian are a vile and savage race, scattered into hundreds of tribes all over the world. Why do you ask? She said back. Jason did something as the carriage suddenly came to a gravelly halt, and everyone was jerked forward while his treasure trove of weapons shifted into the forward area. You have Orkian in your world? He asked, and she just nodded, noticing his eyes going a bit wider as he thought it over. You can keep that then. If it glows blue, it means that there is a Orkian near you. She furrowed her four brows, then looked over to him. How? She asked. Um, quell enchantment. The stories that that weapon is from have both, and they are not friendly. He said, but she looked confused at his words. Which word did not translate? She uttered the short word and then added, it translated as my own race. Jason started to move the carriage again. Huh. He again withdrew and thought over the answer. So the quell I am referring to are tallish and thinner than myself. They are described as graceful and elegant, pointed ears like yours, but only two eyes and skin was like mine. They are also considered to be extremely capable of using magic and have mastery over a few forms of martial skills, and they can live for a few thousand or more years she thought over the information. If they were masters of magic, then maybe they were her kind, but from a story made to be closer to what his world could comprehend. She didn't think about it much longer, as she used her new mana pool to form a basic message spell to her mother and sisters who were in the city. I have succeeded with the ritual, but the village was attacked by raiders. The summoned creature is unaffected by the magic, and we are on our way to the city. It calls itself Jason and has agreed to help us as long as we respect its freedom and autonomy. I say again, it is unaffected by the magic, and we can't take forceful control of it. Lastly, do not anger it. Its power and way of war is honorless and terrifying. We need that fury pointed at the Chiantics, not us. She waited for a few seconds while staring at the sword he had given her, but looked up as the message spell was returned by her mother, her voice ringing clearly in her mind. That is unfortunate to hear. I do not like the idea of it being loose in our cities and towns, but we will work for an answer for the next two days until you arrive. Hopefully, we will have a solution for how to keep it in line. Liani pouted and formed a new spell, calling out to her family again. We have already passed the village of Luavain and will arrive a few hours before nightfall. Moreover, I had to apologize to him after he had read through my actions to bind him. If you try to wield power over him, I will not stand against him. Rather, I would beg it to spare me and our people. If you do not believe me, then look at what I have experienced since he arrived in our world. Please, my queen and mother, trust me in this. We will win the war and secure our future with his help. She didn't get a reply, but looked over at him, his eyes watching the path they were traveling over with exceptional speed, and realized that she needed to make something clear. Is there any way I can get you to not be mad or angry with my people if the nobles or royals act foolish? Jason blinked twice in a bit of confusion. Um, well, for one thing, I would not hurt or cause harm to civilians. I am a soldier, not a monster. I will fight and help you win the war. And if your mother or someone else tries, I will let them off the hook once. After that, I make no guarantees for their safety. 
he said in a grim note. The second thing is that I don't hold people for the actions of their rulers. It would be like holding a child for the sin of a parent. His tone was calm and direct, and he was truly honest. She was locked on him, her mind piecing his statements. Wait, everyone gets one pass? She asked. Jason nodded. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. You get one pass because you didn't know better. Do it again, and it's intentional, which means you get a free ride to lower planes, he said, and narrowed his eyes as though he was trying to make out whatever he was seeing. Um, there is a fork. Which way? Liani looked out the front window. Left, we should be about. A low rumble sounded from her stomach that was joined by Jason and three of their passengers, and she snapped her eyes to him, the rush of blood from embarrassment filtering to her cheeks. But his cheek, the one she could see was a shade of red, which she assumed was the same reaction that she had. Um, we didn't get any food, did we? Jason said as he looked over to her, getting a shake of her head. And he leaned back. How far to the city? About three more hours, she said quickly and looked back to the rest of the passengers. She looked back to him as he held his hands out in front of him, then grimaced at the large package of some sort of hard and partly reflective materials. And he put it aside, then summoned seven more, before moving the carriage a bit off the path after making the turn. He undid the belt, grabbed packs, and tossed them to the back until he handed one to her, took one to himself, and started explaining how to use what he assured them was technically food. Food? How? How can this be a weapon? She asked as soon as he said it. He looked up at her and smiled. If you are fed too much, it will kill you, therefore it is a weapon. He said in a tone she felt odd about, that aside, this stuff is barely considered food, so don't eat more than you can handle. Don't worry about finishing it. They spent a good amount of time eating, and while he finished, no one else ate all of it. Not that any of them were complaining, they affirmed they were satisfied. They continued down the road and reached the outer walls and closed gate of a city that Jason looked at with a bit of marvel, close to the later edge of the afternoon as the sky encroached tonight. He stopped the carriage, and she got out of the war carriage he had used and called up to the walls, Open the gates, I am Princess Liani Wizaltrix. I am here to speak with the queen. He stepped out too, but shuddered as he created the battle staff he first used. But the gate opened a second later as a single rider came out. The rider Lini noticed was someone she didn't want to meet. It was her eldest sister riding atop her greater war beast. Her armor gleamed a bit where the light landed. Her sister looked down on her with a fair bit of disapproval, then turned to Jason and cocked her brow. My grand queen and mother said it is not bonded, she asked in a directed tone to her but Jason spoke before she could answer. I am not an it. I am Captain Jason Coleman, United States Rangers, male. Am 29 years old, and sorry, I am not bonded, but considering your attitude to the only other part of the royal family I know, I am guessing you are the crown princess. Jason said in a polite but pointed tone, however, readied his staff as soon as she reached for her sword. I recommend you don't. While I am not sure about the wingless feline, I am sure that 5.56 will still kill you at least. Liani ran and got between the two. Stop, please, let's just go to see the queen and discuss this in detail with her. She had tasked me to summon him, and I did. I would like for him to do what we summoned him for. But for that, he can't be treated as a summoned beast or familiar. His race is a thinking race, one our own religion obligates us to not bind, she said with as much authority as her station could muster. Her sister glared at Jason while his eyes flicked from her to her sister. His expression was ready, but hesitant. Clicking her tongue as she let go of her sword, her sister relaxed in her saddle and shifted her gaze to Leani. You are responsible for it. You will go straight to the palace, and then you will have a few minutes to look respectable, she said before pulling on the reins and turning the beast around and back in, followed shortly by the gates opening more. Leani turned around to Jason and glared. He looked down at her, but smiled. Sorry, I don't like being called an it. I am a man, not an object, he said in an apologetic tone. She had to sigh. Just please keep your tongue in check with my mother. She can't let an insult slide. She then turned and climbed back into the carriage, followed closely by him. 
They had spent a few minutes unloading their passengers, and Lini gave them a few coins she had and wished them luck. Then they made their way to the palace. She had changed into a dress that fit her, but was caught a bit off guard as she joined Jason. He was dressed in trousers that were a shade of tan, with a tunic of some kind green with a tan shirt and tie, and had a hat of some odd shape that flopped a bit off the side of his head. He had some medals and pins of different colors. She wasn't sure why, but the sight of him dressed like that made her hearts pound a bit harder. Then she looked away and started walking to the audience hall. As they walked in, there was a murmur of the few nobles present, more than a few questioning his dress coming to the foot of the steps that lead up the throne. She looked up and took a kneel, but the murmuring grew louder, and she looked behind her as Jason didn't bend a knee or even do much more. However, before she could tell him otherwise, her mother spoke. In your world, do people not bend a knee to monarchs? The queen asked in a calm and even tone, but she watched as Jason bowed a bit. No, they do only to their monarchs, however. I was left stunned by your majesty's divine beauty. Forgive my staring. I am Captain Jason Coleman, United States Rangers. I am here to offer my assistance towards your current war. I have a plan, but it is one that will take me about 150 days to activate he said in a calm and clear tone. Once started, I will not only win the war for you, but give your nation with an army that can kill and kill again. No nation but you will be able to start and end a war in a week. His statement and tone made the hall break down any decorum that it held, as more than a few nobles started to laugh outright and hall insults his way. But he just straightened out and locked his eyes on the queen, getting her to raise a hand, making the room fall silent a second later. Captain, how exactly do you plan on doing this? You are asking us to hold the enemy off for close to half a year, and then you will somehow do what? Lini felt her blood grow cold again as Jason grinned, her formerly light blush at the odd handsomeness he had now drained of color as she saw the dangerous entity she had witnessed in that village this morning. I am going to give you a 200 fighters that will be loyal to you and fight like me. Instead of marching across your lands, they will ride in carriages of steel and alchemist glue. They will kill your enemies not by the sword, shield, or arrow, but by the use of a well-made battle staff of fire and earth. They will be able to engage the enemies wherever they hide. I plan to give you a small army of men and women that can wield my weapons and use my fighting style, he said with a determined look in his eyes. And if you really want to see how powerful I plan to make them, then call up someone sentenced to death, equip them in everything a knight would need, and watch me deliver them justice all the same. The queen said nothing but wave her hand, then turned to face him before looking down at Liani. Her eyes furrowed a bit before she spoke. Princess Liani, you had witnessed this Jason's way of war and called it honorless and terrifying. Care to elaborate? Liani glanced up for a second. I would actually make an addendum to my words my queen, while his way of warfare is indeed honorless. He himself is an honorable man, however. I can't exactly describe what he had done. The weapon my spell was meant to be used by him are absent from his arsenal. Instead, he uses weapons that can kill enemies with thunderclaps, or cut his foes down from a distance like the great claws of a no-guard, or spew torrents of flames like a salamander. Moreover, it seems his training in the art of combat and kill is so effective that he has used his power to summon things that I had never even considered weapons. My queen, I am certain that without Jason's help, we will lose this war. However, I would advise that he takes over the siege at Qualmalaire before he starts preparations for his plan, she said in a respectful tone. You would suggest that I take command from your aunt and give it to a man? The queen asked pointedly. Liani felt the eyes of everyone on her skin, their distaste for her suggestion clear as a few murmured in the background, and she looked away from the queen. Yes, my queen, this Jason will without a shadow of a doubt in my mind be able to retake the city within a week if not sooner, as our spies have confirmed that the city's inhabitants have all already been killed off, and thus it is just a walled city we can't breach, she said, and kept her eyes mostly down until the doors opened as the sounds of footsteps came in. Looking over her shoulder, she could see a woman, a traitor that sold national secrets to the Vishal was been pushed in. Lady Pilfall, congratulations. Today you have a chance at freedom, 
As you have noticed, you have been given armor. In a few seconds, you will be freed and given a weapon. Your task is to kill the man dressed in green. Succeed, and you will be released. The queen's voice rang out, and the prisoner looked around and locked her eyes on Jason. However, as soon as she took up her sword and started to rush him, he willed the battle staff he used into his hands, and three thunderclaps rang. Leonie was ready and had covered her ears before, but the rest of the hall reeled back. The Lady Pillfall fell with three holes in her, two in her chest, pouring out her green lifeblood soaking into the stone under her and one hole between her four eyes.